Welcome to the Retro Hack Shack. I'm Mira Newcomb. Recently, I went to a local recycling center where I often try to find old equipment, uh, retro computers and things like that. Here's a picture of uh, the time that I went there with my buddy Tom, literally picking through a table of stuff that people had donated. Uh, I was able to find actually an old Game Boy here, an old Atari Junior. And then I looked over into a bin uh, which at the very bottom had this old monitor. And I wasn't sure what it was, but I grabbed it out. This thing was filthy. Uh, but today I'm going to take a look at that, that monitor and see if I can get it working again and hopefully add it to my collection. It's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. So before I started working on this monitor, I wanted to see if I could find out a little more about it. Original manuals and schematics can make fixing a monitor like this a lot easier. Unfortunately, several Google and forum searches turned up very little. I did find the FCC information, which indicates it was manufactured by Fujitsu. I also found several price listings in old computer magazines. It seems like there was two models that came out around 1984. The MJ-10, which was a composite-only monitor, and this one, the MJ-22, which included composite and RGB input. One ad stated it was similar to the Commodore 1902, but the looks, to me anyway, are more similar to the Commodore 1702, which was already out, and the inputs on the back of the monitor are kind of similar to the 1084P. Let's take a look at this full page ad from the April 1985 edition of Popular Computing. You can see here they're making a bold statement that this is the only monitor you'll ever need, uh, which I guess was kind of true at the time, although it was just a few years later that VGA would come out and kind of uh, sweep the, the market in terms of uh, monitor technologies, and that would last for quite a while. But they, they, you know, they give you eight reasons basically that this monitor is better than other monitors. Um, they say in number three here, compare the grayscale. You get four sh shades of gray on the MJ22. Um, I could make a joke there, but it's probably not appropriate. But just uh, <laughs> imagine for yourself, I guess, at this point. And then it says to compare linearity. It says there's hardly any distortion on the MJ22. I guess if we get this up and working, uh, we can see if it's uh, if that's actually true or not. It also talks about uh, versatility, and this is actually something that is pretty cool about this monitor, is that it does accept RGB composite or separated video, meaning Luma and Chroma, I believe. So that's actually pretty cool, and it would give it an advantage over other monitors that were either composite only or uh, RGB only. So that, that's pretty neat. And then it talks about the screen size, which is also pretty funny now as I'm, you know, staring at my whatever this is, 26 inch monitor or something. But, you know, at the time, 13 inch monitors were fairly common and it should be a little bit cheaper, which is true based on the ads that I saw where people were selling both Commodore monitors and other monitors as well as uh, the Technica monitor. Okay, now let's take a look at the monitor itself. Uh, by the way, did I mention this thing was filthy? Because it is. It looks like it was stored in a barn or something. It's been thrown around probably during the recycling process, so it's got scuffs on the outside of it, lots of black marks, you know, where it would have landed in a bin or something. Um, in addition, the power cord has been cut off, and that's usually for one of two reasons. Either it was deemed unsafe at some point, like it blew up or something, and they cut it off to keep it safe, or they cut it off to make it easier for transport in the recycling facility, and I'm hoping it's the latter. Also, it looks like it's missing the screws on the bottom, and to me that's another sign that somebody may have been in here or taken it apart because it wasn't working at some point. On the front, there's a nice array of adjustments, including a switch between composite and RGB, which would be perfect for a Commodore 128, which includes both of those video outputs for 80 column and C64 compatibility. And in some cases, there were some games that took advantage of this where you could switch back and forth or connect two monitors, I believe, to play games. If you know about those games that where you could switch back and forth, um, let me know in the comments below. 
And you can also see the video inputs on the back here. I'm not sure what RGB mode one and three are or what the difference is, but having the capability to separate the Luma and Chroma along with regular composite input and RGB input is actually really nice to have on a monitor of this era. Because I couldn't find the manual, I went ahead and ordered a cable on eBay that said you could use it to connect this monitor to a Commodore 128, and if it works, then I can document the pinout later. But before I can even work on this at all, I need to at least knock off some of the dust and grime. So I brought it outside and used a brush and some compressed air just to get through the first layer of filth before I started working on the internals. So the first thing that needed to be done was to remove the remaining screws just to check the status of the monitor and inspect everything to make sure that there wasn't any shorts or obvious things going on. So at first glance, this board looks pretty good, but I did notice there's a five amp fuse right there. So that's the first thing I'm gonna do is just see if that fuse is open um, or not. It's 125 volts, but it's only a five amp fuse, so we'll see. So I've got my meter. I'll take a look at that fuse, but uh, really this board is pretty clean considering how dirty the outside is. Let's see if this is open or closed. Short. So the fuse is still good. It hasn't blown. So just looking around at this board, I don't see initially any capacitors or anything like that that is that looks like they've uh, they've blown or leaked. It all looks pretty good. But you never know. I'm going to look a little bit closer, see if I can find any reefa caps or anything like that that looks like it might be damaged. So I really haven't found anything that sticks out. I did notice that this uh, this uh, metal shield here is just a giant heat sink, and it's also holding the flyback transformer on. <clears throat> so I thought that was pretty interesting that they were using this as a uh, as a big heat sink. I'm not sure exactly what. Come on, focus. I'm not exactly sure what part that is, but I will look it up and see. And the only other part that seems suspect to me, which is located in the back um, and could be potentially, um, could have been exposed to some water damage or something, is this uh, either transformer or voltage regulator. Um, I'll have to look it up and see which one it is, but that's the only other thing that I can see that might be bad with this. Otherwise, I can't find anything that's... Uh, uh, that stands out. Everything, it, you know, I've looked for, uh, you know, tantalums that could have blown or components that are obviously blown, but, you know, really nothing in here looks that bad to me right now. So I'm going to check out those two parts and then I'll probably connect a good power cord to it and plug it in and keep my fingers crossed. I decided to use one of these IEC connectors and there's enough room over in this side of the back of the case that I can just put this IEC connector whoop, like that in the back of the case and secure it that way. That way I don't, I can just use any IEC type cable to, to power it. And I don't have to have a cord constantly hanging out, getting in the way and, and so forth. I thought this might be a ferrite bead here, but in looking at it, it's really not. It's just a piece of plastic, which, um, uh, creates a stop for the a cable stop so it doesn't pull out. And this is actually going to come in handy. So I'm going to keep this and maybe use it for another project where I do need to have a cable like this inside of a project and I don't want it to come out through a hole. So that's kind of a nice pickup. So, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, solder this on so that I can test this monitor out. And this particular monitor or this particular IEC plug has, is the type that has a, uh, um, a fuse built in. So I put a four amp fuse in there because I really don't think this will pull more than that. But if it blows, I can always put an eight amp fuse in. And then on the back side here, you, I don't know if you can see that, but it has the markings, which is really nice for load, neutral and ground. So I know where to solder everything.
Okay, so I've got the power connected through the IEC. I've moved everything back out of the way. Uh, if I haven't mentioned this before, make sure you know what you're doing before you attempt anything like this. But I just want to see if I get a picture, and then I will disconnect it and definitely not be touching the uh, anywhere around the tube after this point, or I will discharge the tube before I do anything else. Most likely, I will just leave it alone and not do anything if it works. Um, if, it, if it doesn't work, then I might have to discharge. We'll see. All right, I'm going to plug it in, and we'll see if anything exciting happens. Okay, here goes the uh, power is off on the monitor, but I'm plugging it into the uh, mains. Okay, so the transformer should be getting power. Okay, let's go ahead and turn it on and see if anything happens. Definitely something there. Not seeing anything on the screen, although I am, the, the tube is definitely on. And I can hear the static going away. So something happened. I think what I'm going to do now is uh, hook up a, an input on the back, a composite input, and see if I can actually get any kind of picture at all. Uh, I went ahead and got a Commodore 128 and hooked it up to the RGB output. Um, and so let's see if, turn the monitor on and turn the Commodore on, if we get a picture. Here we go. Oh, look at that. <laughs> it actually works. It's working! Alright, so this actually works just fine. You can type in a command here. There we go. And this is in 80 column mode as well. So I went ahead and switched it into 80 column mode. Um, if I reboot it, if I put it in 40 column mode and reboot, nope, I've got to be in 80 column mode. Here we go, 1985 Commodore Electronics, which is, I think, what this monitor was actually built for, was the Commodore 128 or something similar. It works with a lot of different monitors, but that is awesome that that works. So I think I should try composite out before I get too excited. Okay, so I just went out and got the first thing I could find uh, out of the garage that had composite, and that is the Apple IIc, which I believe is also a period uh, compatible. Any composite should work, but uh, I think the Apple IIc came out in 84, maybe 86. I can't remember. Right around that time frame. Pretty sure it was 84. And uh, it does have composite out, so this should work. I'm just going to change this to composite instead of RGB. Turn it on. And let's see what we get. Look at that. Apple IIc, right there. Awesome, so composite's working as well. Let's just go ahead and fire up the disk. I've got Oregon Trail here. There it is. Wow, it looks actually really good. There's still a lot of uh, dirt and grime on the screen. So this is actually gonna look even better once that's cleaned up. I'm sure there's a lot of flicker probably on the screen. Apologize for that. But this is looking pretty good. Travel the trail. I'm a banker from Boston. <laughs> it just autofills the names. Are these names correct? Yes. Look at that. Not bad. Going back to 1848. Ta-da! So that's awesome. This looks actually looks a lot better than I thought. So now the only question is, can I get it cleaned up enough? I can't believe the only thing that was wrong with it is that someone had cut off the power cable. That's crazy. Sitting in the bottom of a recycle bin, essentially. Wow. Okay, Let's see if I can get it cleaned up. Okay, now that everything's powered off, I wanted to show you, you know, the way I've got this set up for testing and why you need to be careful. So this is the mains power that's coming in. It's unplugged now. 
this is the mains power that's coming in. And if you were to grab, you know, this to try to move it out of the way, you could easily electrocute yourself on mains power right there. Um, also underneath the board, if I had anything sitting on this table, the table's non-conductive, but if I had anything metal or anything um, under this that could conduct electricity, mains power basically flows right in just over here. So that would obviously be a problem. And then the biggest problem is right here where um, you definitely don't want to touch there because that's high voltage, really high voltage, much higher than the mains voltage. So um, like I said before, know what you're doing before you attempt a project like this. I would highly recommend, um, you know, in this case, I made sure to unplug everything anytime I wasn't using it, um, made sure that there wasn't any kids or other people around that were going to come in and stick their hand in here. Um, and also, um, you know, before you attempt a project like this with high voltage involved, my recommendation is to work with someone who's done it before that knows what they're doing. Um, I've been able to do that at the makerspace, my local makerspace. So um, if you want to do a project like this, you haven't done it before, my recommendation is don't do this kind of work um, with either mains voltage or definitely not with high voltage going to a CRT like this. Until you've had a chance to work with someone that knows what they're doing, they can show you what to watch out for and how to be careful around this equipment. Just a quick safety tip. Okay, so I've got to figure out a way to mount this IEC plug in the back of the case. There's room for it, but the plastic on that case is a bit soft. And I don't know if you can see here the uh, amount of overlap on the IEC plug um, is pretty small in the top and the bottom. Uh, there's quite a bit on the side, but I'm a little concerned if you try to plug really hard, if you try to plug a plug into this or pull a plug out, that the plastic might either you know rip through the, the screws here, I might have to use some washers, uh, or you might actually push the plug through the plastic because it's a little soft. Um, not a huge concern, but a little concern in that when I make my hole in the plastic, if I make the hole too big, then obviously that leaves a lot more room for that to happen, for this to push through. So I'm trying to create a template on the back here. And this is a good tip if you're kind of using, uh, if you're doing any kind of template like this for cutting uh, something out and you need a template. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace around it. But as you can see, there's these, there's the uh, uh, terminal uh, connections here where you connect the wire. And of course, that's going to make it hard if I set this down, you know, this is going to wiggle around. I'm not going to be able to lay this out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my uh, X-Acto knife, which I've lost. Where's my X-Acto knife? Okay, I found my X-Acto knife. So in order to get this flat, what I'm going to do is make some indentations on this box so I can see where that's going to go. And this way, I can make some little slots. Whoops. I can make some little slots in the cardboard and push this down flat. So that should just go flat. Now it's flat to the cardboard. And I can do the same with this piece of paper so that I can get it nice and flat. And then, um, then it'll allow me to trace really easily the, uh, around the bottom of this to make my template. There we go. Everything's as flat as it can get. It can't, there's a little tab on the bottom here, so it can't get perfectly flat, but this is going to be close enough that I can trace around this with a sharp pencil. So this line should be roughly the same size as this. So if I cut this out very uh, precisely with some scissors, then I'll have a template that I can then go mark the back of the monitor case and use that as a guide to cut out with the Dremel tool, cut the plastic out and make this hole. Okay, so I moved out here to the garage and I'm about to cut through the plastic with the Dremel tool. Uh, one thing to remember is that with the Dremel tool, you can lower your speed just a little bit. You're not cutting through metal. Also wear eye protection. If you don't normally wear glasses, put on some, some goggles. And if you're cutting through anything that is, uh, could either put a uh, par particulate in the air, like when you're cutting through a uh, fiberglass 
perf board, for example, something like that, make sure you wear a mask because that uh, those little particles can get in your lungs and become embedded there, and you don't want that to happen either. In this case, I've got my glasses on. I'm going to be go very slow, take my time, and cut out exactly on this line or just a little inside. Like I said, I can always go back and file it. One more thing that's interesting um, about this, the back of this case, it's possible that this mold was also used for televisions as well. And I say that because there's a indentation here, like this was supposed to be cut out at some point for, I would guess, a TV tuner to go back here. And this is where you would connect your antenna. Let's see, 84? Yeah, probably antenna, not cable. This is where you would connect your antenna uh, uh, or your input from your from your antenna. And it looks like there uh, is a hole here. Potentially, that was for an antenna, a built-in antenna that you would just slide up, one of those retractable antennas that would go there. I don't know that for certain, but it just looks like that to me. Okay, so let's go slow and cut out this section for the IEC plug. Okay, there's the first stab at the hole, and now I just have to go through and break off these uh, melted plastic bits and do a little bit of filing, and that'll, that should be just about right. Well, that was a lot more sanding than I expected to do, but the result is it's a really tight fit, and you can see I can push on that plug. I don't want to push on it too hard, but I can push on it with quite some force and the plastic isn't moving. This isn't moving around at all in that hole. Now I'm going to drill a couple of holes for the mounting screws. Should be done. And before I solder the wires onto here, it's time to clean this case up. With all these projects, I always start by removing any of the components from the plastics and then cleaning the plastics with warm soap and water. If you've never done this type of restoration before, you'd be surprised at how well just regular plain old soap and warm water does on these old plastic parts. Here you can see the difference between the back of the case, which I washed, and the front of the case, which I haven't. The difference is pretty dramatic already. I decided not to take the tube out of the front part of the case, just because it's kind of a lot of hassle, and I think I can clean around it without actually having to take it out. However, this sticker, there's got to be something done about it. It's really stuck down there, and uh, I need to find some way to take it off. So I'm just going to put a little orange oil on this, let it soak for 15-20 minutes, come back and see if I can scrape off some of that sticker residue. And after about 20 minutes, I was able to take the first layer of the sticker off, but there was still another layer that had to come off underneath, so it was time to add a little bit more orange oil and try one more time. And after another 20 minutes, I was able to get the rest of the sticker off and uh, it came off really well, actually. Now, there is gonna be some discoloration left behind from that sticker, so if you have any ideas of what I should do about that little area on top beyond doing a full retro bright, let me know in the comments below. Now that that sticker is gone for the front of the case, I'm just gonna go over the whole thing with some Windex and some paper towels. I find that's the next best thing to warm soapy water to get rid of as much gunk as possible before you need to do some deep cleaning. This thing is just so dirty. It's really filthy. I had I went through several rounds of uh, paper towels and I ended up with a whole pile of them at the end. Next, for areas that are a little more stubborn, I usually use one of these green scouring pads. It works especially well on textured plastics. Finally, for those areas that are really stubborn, I uh, learned a little trick from the 8-Bit guy, which is to use some baking soda on a wet paper towel, either you wet it with Windex or uh, a little bit of water and a little scrubbing. Now, this is an abrasive, and so essentially you are sanding these spots down, but it's gentle enough that it can be used 
pretty good on most areas. Just be careful you don't rub any paint off. If this were painted plastic, I definitely wouldn't be using it because I know I would go right through the paint and you'd have a big open spot underneath where uh, you took the paint off, even with the baking soda. And as you can see, it does a pretty good job. Okay, so I've installed the IEC plug in the back of the case and screwed that in. The only thing left to do now is to solder the wires back on. And then if I ever want to open this again, it'll open kind of like this, like a clamshell with this attached. Um, this is not the, this is not a spade type connector. So I couldn't just put uh, those little spade connectors on here. Otherwise that would have been perfect because I always could have disconnected those and then taken away this whole thing. As it is, I probably won't have to get in here that much at this point unless something goes wrong, fingers crossed. So I will be just soldering these on. And then if for some reason I have to get in later, maybe I'll change my mind and do something different. But for now, this should work just fine. And that's three. And those are on there pretty good. Nice and tight. Now I'll just slide up the uh, shrink wrap and then I'll use the heat gun to shrink that on and everything should be good to go. Okay, let's put it together. So these two screws were missing, so I found two matching screws in a uh, pile of scrap screws that fit perfectly. And the other thing I noticed when I turned this upside down is it's missing two feet. So I'll get those put on and this project should be done. While I was putting the feet on, the other thing I noticed was this cute little bar that you can pull down to tilt your monitor up so you can view it at just the right angle. That's really nice. So just to remind you where this started, when I got this thing, I didn't even know if it was going to work. The power cord had been cut off and every single inch of it was covered in crud. After a lot of work and effort, this is the result. Well, it goes without saying that I'm really excited about the way this turned out. I had no idea that this dirty, filthy monitor that I pulled literally out of the bottom of a recycling bin, uh, trash bin essentially, would come out this nice. It's a really, really nice monitor, very crisp. And now that it's all cleaned up, it looks a thousand percent better. And it's something that I'm certainly going to use on future videos and just when I'm trying to play some games on my retro machines. Um, I also want to thank all of you that have subscribed. There's been a lot of subscribers lately, a lot more people liking my videos. The comments that you've left have been great in terms of more detail. If you have more information about these Technica monitors or if you used one when uh, uh, they came out back in 1984 or thereabouts, leave a comment below and tell me your story. I'd love to hear from you what your experience has been. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe now, hit the like button, and uh, if you really want to support what I do, go, a go ahead and check out my Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash retrohackshack. And by donating there, you get access to me in terms of leaving direct comments, things that I see more readily. And you also get to vote on what episodes are coming up next and maybe 
register for some giveaways and things like that. So definitely take out, check out the Patreon page as well. I hope everyone's staying safe. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.